Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Anil Jain. He is Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Information Officer at Explorus Inc., a Cleveland-based big data healthcare analytics company formed in 2009 based on innovations that he developed while at the Cleveland Clinic. He leads informatics, product management, training, and professional services. Dr. Jane spent 16 years at the Cleveland Clinic, most recently as Senior Executive Director of IT, and he led several health IT innovations. He continues to practice medicine and teach medical residents as consulting staff at the Cleveland Clinic's Department of Internal Medicine. Dr. Jane has authored more than 100 publications and abstracts and has given numerous talks at national and international meetings on the benefits of health IT and how big data analytics can support quality improvement and biomedical research. He has many, many other accomplishments. He'll be talking today about leveraging de-identified patient data in the cloud, opportunities and challenges. Thanks, Sharona, and thanks for the, the opportunity to speak in front of you guys this morning. I think um, a lot of what you're going to be seeing, some of it will be a repeat um, or reiteration of things that Sharona, David, and Barbara have already mentioned, and some of it will be things that I know that Andy will be spending a little bit more time on later on. But, you know, like any other big data company, we have to have a lot of slides. So even though I have a lot of slides, I'm hoping to go through them quickly and to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So, um, again, we just uh, talked a little bit about the, the, the challenges and the opportunities of big data in the cloud. And, and don't get caught up with the cloud concept. Think of the cloud as just a place that's not within your premises where information is stored. And people think they look up when they think of the cloud, but it's really, you know, across town or across the state or across the country in a large data center. And it's just that it's not on your premises. So I, I'll use the word cloud, but we'll get into why it's, th it's not such a mystical term. And many of our data already in different settings is already in the cloud, whether we realize it or not. So we're going to be talking about the opportunities and then also the challenges and barriers, and hopefully also discuss some of the things that we've done to overcome some of those barriers. Uh, and then the, some of the solutions that we can offer once we've overcome some of those barriers. So about Explorers, who are we? Uh, we talked about how we're a cloud-based health IT platform, and not just a platform, but we also offer applications. One of those applications happens to be a research application, and we'll spend the bulk of our time there. Um, we're based in Cleveland uh, and have no plans to, to move out of Cleveland. We are very much a Cleveland and Ohio affinity company. Our leadership is Ohio-based, uh, and uh, as we, as Shona mentioned, we're a spinoff of the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we happen to be located right now at the old MOCA building, which is on the edge of the Cleveland Clinic campus. Uh, our currently, uh, because of our, the nature of our business, uh, is a big data platform. Uh, our value proposition is to be able to aggregate and combine all the data into a single network. And what does this network look like today? And actually, this is about a week old. We haven't made the public announcement yet, but um, multiply all the numbers by, by another 50%. Uh, we have 120 hospitals from 13 IDNs, again, soon to be much higher, representing about 100,000 providers. And we are a very provider-centric company. So not pharma, not health plan, but provider-centric. We have in our database, um, if you think of the big cloud as a database, although that may not be the most accurate description, we have about 20 million, 22 million, 24 million thereabouts patients today, soon to be a lot higher. And if you think about the healthcare delivery of our partner organizations, about $31 billion in care. And I'll explain why this all makes a difference in a minute. You see some of the logos of our organizations. The most impressive part of this is that we've been able to get, the, uh, get a wide variety of folks from across the country, even though we're Cleveland-based. But we, because we are Cleveland-based, you'll see that Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, Metro Health are our first three uh, partners in this process. But we also have Summa Health, Akron General, and uh, Catholic Health Partners down in Cincinnati as part of our network, and several large systems on both coasts as well. Well, where do we come from? We talked about how it was a Cleveland Clinic spinoff, but it really started back in 2003. A few years after, we started our EPIC implementation about a year after, I think, Metro did probably late 1999, and we would often, as an internist, I would often get these reports about how my diabetic patients were doing, and there was random chart reviews of 25 patients where someone had to painstakingly go through paper charts to tell me how I was doing. 
But once we started going to electronic health records, I was still getting the same reports of 25 patients. And so we decided, well, why can't we go through the database in a, again, a, from a clinical point of view, uh, go through there and tell me about all my 253 di diabetics that I knew that I had because most internists and docs are pretty good about knowing who their patients are. So we started a group and uh, formed it within the IT division where we were able to leverage the data within our electronic health record to do quality and, and patient safety. Uh, and then we started branching out into clinical research and helping uh, for clinical trial recruitment, et cetera. So between 2003 and uh, 2011, when I formally left the Cleveland Clinic in this role, uh, we had supported over 40 clinical trials, um, numerous grants, uh, I'd say well over 100 manuscripts and abstracts, uh, multiple presentations at national meetings, including many meetings at the Epic User Group. And in fact, Epic as a vendor uses much of the work that we did in this template of how organizations that use M uh, Epic can leverage uh, its system for, for clinical research. But we also work with Cleveland Clinic Innovations to spin out the technology into a commercial venture because from a sustainability point of view, it was the way that we felt that we can get the solution to as many people as, as needed it in a safe way, in a cost-effective way. Um, well, why data? Why do we even have data and why does it exist and why are we in a space that, and why do we believe that it's only going to get worse? Well, this is about a year or so after I started practicing full-time, uh, a paper came out uh, from the IOM that suggested that we were uh, healthcare providers were killing about 100,000 patients. Now, I shouldn't say that actively, maybe they were just dying, but we were somehow responsible for, uh, for them. And, and there was a significant cost associated with it. 100,000 is not a number to sneeze at, it's a pretty large number. It shook a lot of people up. There was a large amount of, of emphasis, but then 2011, the year I formally left full-time practice or full-time at the Cleveland Clinic, um, the Commonwealth Fund did a similar report and suggested that we were killing about 100,000 patients. So in the 10 years since that uh, first report, not much had changed. Um, and of course, people were paying attention to this process. Uh, we, we knew that there was a significant number of studies that were showing that mistakes were being made. Uh, the, the electronic health record, in many ways, was being positioned to solve some of these mistakes. And a strategy came out from the, uh, national, the uh, national Strategy for Quality Improvement came out and suggested a variety of ways in order to improve this process. Almost everything they talked about involved data. Um, and there's a common theme that you'll see as we go through the process. Even electronic health records, uh, the, the whole idea is that they generate data that allows people to do the right thing, either at the point of care or after the fact. And this is the paper that David alluded to from Better Health Greater Cleveland, where we showed that systems that were using electronic health records uh, at least had documented better care and possibly even delivered better care than those systems that didn't use electronic health records. Studies like this and studies that preceded this were used by our government to push electronic health records, and as Sharona said, meaningful use and the incentive payments that came along with it uh, really is what drives the, the big data demands. And eventually, uh, you'll, you know, the, the whole goal of the uh, RI Act and the, the high tech bill was to get technology in the hands of providers, both in the ambulatory setting, setting and inpatient. And much of the, the, the impetus was the fact that we were pretty far behind many other industrialized countries. Um, this is just an example of from, from uh, back in 2009. It hasn't changed much, as David said. About 40% of docs are using uh, EMRs in one capacity or another. The, the, uh, the, th the, the high tech bill really uh, pushed the idea of using electronic health records uh, because of these reasons. And I'm not going to touch, touch or go into it any further than this because it's been touched upon. But this really gave companies and gave people that were interested in data a significant uh, leverage in the fact that they would, they would be a lot more data coming forward and uh, taking or allowing companies like ours and others the ability to shape how that data would look like and how that data would come and, and some of the regulatory and uh, privacy rules around it, uh, meaning lobbying, uh, would occur at the same time. So the promises of health IT from, from uh, many folks was really around improving quality of care. And, you know, there's many articles that suggest that EMRs don't improve quality of care, or at least not the way that they're implemented, and there's just as many that show that they do. Whether it does or not, a lot of it depends on how it's implemented and how people are trained. Giving a stethoscope to a clinician doesn't make them any better at able to detect murmurs unless you teach them what to listen for and, and how to distinguish between normal and abnormal. It's the same thing with an electronic health record, and it's the same thing with any form of health IT. It's a tool. The process, the politics, the people are the most important part of any technology uh, deployment. Uh, there's also this promise of interoperable health IT. And uh, I don't think we're close to being perfect there, 
but it's a significantly better than it was when we first started introducing the concept of interoperability. Uh, and then, of course, uh, then we talk about de-identified uh, data and, you know, clinical data is one thing, but what about price? What about uh, looking at uh, clinical outcomes and clinician process measures and things of that sort? It becomes a little murky, but the promise of it was to be able to quickly analyze outcomes, price, and start getting to comparative effectiveness and cost-benefit analyses. And we're just beginning to start seeing some of those values. Uh, we talked about high-tech bill, and this is a, a sort of a, a quick uh, depiction of the progress that's been made. You'll notice that it has improved, but nowhere near where some other industrialized countries are at. And a lot of it is because of our individualistic nature, the vendor community, the fragmented systems. Uh, patients uh, don't necessarily all want their electronic health record data to be shared, and they sometimes will prefer to go to a doc that's on paper because they don't necessarily want to share. Uh, there's been studies and surveys that show that cl patients do really want to be in charge of what gets shared, and that's been a bit of a, bit of a challenge. For, and, and then again, the doctor-patient relationship changes when you put a computer in front of them or at least put a computer in the exam room. And there's a significant capital investment for EHRs that docs need to get um, around. But the other, other thing besides high tech that's changed the way we look at data, at least the way our company looks at data, is the Affordable Care Act. Almost every aspect of the Affor Affordable Care Act requires data to be analyzed to, or to be able to get a sense of what's actually happening um, with that healthcare system and to carry on the kind of risk that needs to uh, happen in uh, the Affordable Care Act, especially around accountable care. The other um, mandate that's in the uh, Affordable Care Act is that organizations start focusing on population health. Well, again, population health and successful delivery of population health for an organization depends on data. It depends on understanding where uh, those, those patients that are, you're, you're managing, uh, what's happening with them today, what's going to happen with them tomorrow. And a lot of that depends on large data sets that you have to aggregate and understand because it's not about the individual patients, it's about the population. So again, from a treatment point of view, it's, it's a no-brainer, but from a, a research and uh, being able to aggregate this data together to get the right kind of decisions, um, there's, there's a huge technology and regulatory burden when you start combining data from the community, not just from your health system, when you start thinking about population health and accountable care. Um, there's about 140 or so accountable care organizations popping up that are based on CMS standards right now. Uh, they all require some form of being of given data from the government, from CMS, to be able to analyze that data, to do the right thing for the patient, and then to be able to send data back. There's a huge opportunity of all this data moving back and forth to understand what it means and then to be able to aggregate it so that you can get a big picture. This is uh, not a new phenomena. Uh, 1991 was the year I graduated from my biomedical engineering program at Northwestern. And, uh, Nothing has changed, really, when it comes to the, the healthcare situation right, right now. Last month, we had a Time Magazine article that talked about why medical bills are killing us. The vast majority of that talks about the data around cost and, and uh, care delivery, as well as the clinical outcomes. The, the, the fact that we have all this data is an opportunity for, for our government, for our private payers, to realign the way that they pay for different things that, that are, that are uh, being um, offered to patients. Uh, there's no excuse anymore. The data is there now, and they expect companies like ours to be able to analyze that data, uh, to be able to do research on that data, and expect you guys to be able to do that kind of research on that data and give answers back and, and not have this, this uh, big black hole when it comes to why certain things are costing certain uh, 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 prices. There's a huge gap. Again, if you think about the Affordable Care Act, and you think about the value-based care, and you think about accountable care, uh, Every healthcare provider, uh, especially the chief medical officers, the CEOs, the CFOs, they have to be thinking about how do I go from a volume-based uh, practice to a value-based practice? And it's all going to be based on how well they can master the data that's been given to them. And not just the data that they own, if you will, but the data that's been given to them by their payers and by the community because it's, it's transforming to a community-based practice. Now. I want to spend a few minutes just on big data because I want to make sure that and I, this has happened a few times where I've talked about big data and some people feel that it's an invention of healthcare. Um, it's not. Big data has been around forever. Uh, one of the first areas of big data you know, that I, I recall was uh, around the collisions that, that different nuclear particles have in a, in a large collider where there's millions of particles and you have to understand what that all means. 
Uh, big data is kind of relatively new in healthcare. It's actually very late uh, in the game. And what big data really is, is really simply, and I know there's going to be some conversations later on about it, but the, what we look at are the three Vs and then Explorers, we also want two additional Vs. The velocity, which is how fast is information coming in, the volume, how much information is coming in to us to look at, the variety, meaning what are the different types of information. That could be diagnoses, medical records, or medication records, uh, really the, anything, the variety of it. But we, between our 120 hospitals that we've seen, even within the same type of information, there's variability. And so we have to think about variability when, you, when, you, when it comes to big data. And then there's value. Not all data that, that exists has value. And we have to make a decision. Even though the cost of storing and the cost of processing is so low, it's never been this low, we have to think about the value of that data as well. Just bringing it in for the sake of bringing it into a cloud, if you will, still has some uh, cost and risk. So you have to think about the value and the cost benefit of bringing that information in. Uh, this is something that Eric Schmidt, one of the uh, folks at Google, uh, had uh, t talked about was the growth of big data. And he, he, talks something, he talks about this. I'm not sure how true it is anymore. He talks about every two days uh, we create much information as we did from the dawn of civilization. Between my three kids and my wife, I know the Facebook posts that they do, uh, you know, it probably leads to some of this. But the reality of it is that there's huge amounts of big data being generated on a regular basis. And not all of it is useful. But all of it is available to get mashed up with other data to draw useful comparisons. And we need to understand the context of healthcare data with the context of all the other big data that's out there. And if we have time, I'll talk about two cases that I'm familiar with, um, the whole Netflix uh, IMDB database on reviews and being able to re-identify Netflix subscribers and then the, the case um, around the uh, Maryland uh, governor where they were able to re-identify re based on voter records. The point is, is that it's not just about our data. It's about our data combined with all the other data that's uh, available out there. So I, if you've read any of the interviews I've recently done in health IT uh, magazines, you'll hear me talk about the perfect storm. Three things, the Affordable Care Act, the high-tech bill, and the consumerism and devices that have come about uh, had, have led to significant amounts of data. So again, the Affordable Care Act, we can't do the ACA without large amounts of data. And meaningful use means that there's more people with EMRs and more data being generated. And consumerism, you know, we got patients, I saw a patient a couple weeks ago that had a hip, hip implant that was generating big data every time he took a step, right? Pressure, the amount of looseness in the joint, where's all that data going and what does that patient believe is happening with their data? Or the Medtronic, you guys are familiar with the Medtronic lawsuit where a patient had a, I think it was a defibrillator or a pacemaker. You know, so there's a huge opportunity here for us to really understand what does this mean when we get better at putting smart devices in, people's, in people, who owns that, div owns that data that's coming out of the device that's sitting in their body? And of course, omics. Um, not just, it's not just me who thinks that big data is important. McKinsey did this uh, very nice uh, uh, analysis that showed that there was a significant amount of value uh, in healthcare. The question is, why is there so much value? It's really around knowledge. It's not about data. Data is just an artifact trying to drive us from, from information to knowledge. And it's not about what the information is showing us today. It's really about what the information is going to show us tomorrow. So as a company, and I think most of us in healthcare who are looking at the challenges of, in the near future, are really about predictive and prescriptive analytics. And, and, and in terms of, of that goal, uh, it's important for us to be able to understand what are the challenges to being able to use the data to drive towards that. And this truck doesn't look like it's going to tip over, um, but I'd like to pretend it would if you pile all this big data on top of it because most of the traditional IT infrastructure is not ready for this. That's why the cloud-based platform is so appealing for people that want to get into big data um, uh, strategies. Um, you need people that understand big data and understand how to analyze big data and big data in the cloud, especially when it's de-identified. These data scientists are, are really rare to find and they command incredibly high salaries. So if you have any kids that want to pick a new career, um, that's what I want all three of my kids to go into. Um, and of, co of course, we have so much data, uh, but data doesn't always mean knowledge. It's just, it's just data. And then uh, uh, researchers, it's a whole other story. Most researchers, I think David mentioned this as well, don't really know what the limitations of data is. And then data governance, privacy, and security policies, and what that means from what kind of data we're able to leverage uh, is a huge, there's a huge gap there. Uh, the biggest challenge is I know Andy's going to spend some time on this later on. Uh, you know, there's, there's EHR artifact. Um, when I see patients a couple times a month, 
uh, I'm not doing it so that someone else can do a study down the road. I'm doing it because that patient and I have 10 minutes to sit there and figure out what's going on. And, um, you know, there's, I'm, again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I know Andy's going to spend more time on it later. But there's artifact, and you've got to be aware of that artifact. If you're ever, even in a de-identified set, you're going to be able to take advantage of it. Uh, this is just a depiction of the cloud. We have disparate data. So the, one of the other challenges is harmonization. So what do we do and what do other people that do what we do do? They try to standardize into a common national standard. Well, not everything has a national standard, so we have to come up with our own, and so does every other vendor. So again, it introduces silos of, of standards that we may have to leverage in some cases. Uh, we talk about the fragmentation of data, especially in the EHR. And when you de-identify it, it becomes even more uh, uh, difficult than this, but uh, we try to combine data together. In some cases, you will need identifiable information to be able to combine data from payers, from health plans, employers, from the uh, providers, and in, with the advent of PHRs and you know, portable devices where you can enter sugar readings from the patient. Uh, the diagnoses, uh, David alluded to this earlier, we talked about the sensitivity of certain diagnoses. Uh, before we recommend any of our clients do any kind of publications, we recommend they do chart reviews for a subset of data that they have available so they can understand what does the diagnosis on a de-identified data set really mean to them. And this is an example of one where we did it on a chronic kidney disease registry. Now, the way I describe uh, uh, electronic health records and uh, data is that there are socio-technical challenges. There is a significant amount of understanding of how people use the technology before you can make sense of it. So our group, we employ clinical implementation consultants. These are people that watch other people enter information to the record, watch them practice, so that we understand, um, you know, there's, a, there's ten, 10 different ways in one of our customer sites to enter the fact that a patient has quit smoking. Well, if there are 10 different ways, how would anyone know whether a patient really quit smoking or whether you just didn't get that piece of data? So there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done with boots on the ground to watch people. And when you have these large databases, sometimes it's not difficult. Uh, it's difficult to be able to do that. So again, you, we've already heard about clinical and translational research. We've heard about public health. We've heard about healthcare quality improvement. Uh, what our company focuses really on all four of these things. And, we, and the biggest thing that our uh, customers want from us is help us take de-identified data, help us take PHI of, from our organization and drive value and efficiency and optimization of the care processes. Uh, clinical research cycle, use cases we've talked about. Um, we at Explorers employ a statistically identified uh, data set, more so than a complete de-identified safe harbor data set. We feel that having gone through that process, that it makes sense for us, makes sense for our customers and clients that, that leverage it. And in some cases, for within a healthcare organization, we offer the ability to get limited data sets. And then, of course, for our applications that our customer, our uh, provider facing for their, within their healthcare organization, we have, you know, full-blown PHI. So our goal is to be able to give the right level um, to each and every constituent that leverages our, our uh, products. And you guys are the wrong group for me to tell you the definitions of all these things. Um, they're here because I use this. I'm going to be at the NIH in a few uh, weeks. I'm going to use similar stuff there. But um, one of the things that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is this, is that we have to recognize, my last, last slide, I promise, we have to recognize that there's a balancing act between value and security. And I think most of our customers, when we show them this sort of thing, they understand that there's things that they're going to have to do to be comfortable with that. And I'm not going to go through that. You guys understand the risk-based approach. I'm going to stop right here. Sorry. Sure, yeah, and I apologize having glossed over that. So think of the cloud as a piece of a data center that is located on the ground, generally on a ground that is not going to move underneath it and not going to flood and, and all those other things, where there's a certain number of computers that are sitting there storing the data for you uh, with all the safeguards that one would expect and with, with one of two different models that, that I at least I can articulate, and I'm, I'm not the chief technology officer, so there's a, a lot more nuance, but it's really the ability for any of our customers to have um, a parallel multi-processor computing environment without having to pay for it themselves. For example, our customers, like David, 
can leverage a thousand processors in the cloud and do his analyses. So that takes seconds instead of minutes or hours. Um, and it's essentially, it's like the old days. Cloud computing is not new. We just, has a new name. In the old days, it was you'd buy slices of time at a super, supercomputer center. It's not that much different than that. And what we've employed is a series of computers that do both computation and storage at the same time. And uh, it makes it so that everyone gets a great experience without having to pay for it. And there are safeguards from a security and privacy rule. We use the same Department of Defense grade uh, technology for that. Does that help? Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sure. Thinking about integrating heterogeneous data from 120 healthcare systems, uh, EHR systems, just sounds like an impossible problem technically. How do you do it and what gives? There has, something has to give to make that possible. Yeah, that's a great question, Andy. Uh, so what, how we do it is we have 15 folks involved with data curation. These are folks that um, will go in and do a forensics analysis of all the different data sources that exist at our customer sites. And then we'll sit down with the right people and understand which are the most valuable things to go get. We have a common model, if you will, where this is the low-hanging fruit that we will get from every one of our customers so that there is commonality. And then there's the additional information that may be specific to a, to a specific customer that we will not share in our cloud in the same way we would with all our other common data. What gives are the boutique specialty research related stuff that are really good to have but would be almost impossible for us to harmonize across the health systems. But that's changing over time. As meaningful use starts to dictate certain things that need to happen, we're getting better and better at it. But one example would be what gives is cancer. Uh, cancer is heavily outcomes based and we don't do a great job right now with being able to understand and harmonize cancer data across the system. But what we do a great job with is chronic disease and procedural based stuff where there's lots of standards around that. Hey. Uh, Dr. Jane, I'm a medical student working with Dr. Kelbron elective actually. And, uh, one of Sorry the for you. <laughs> appreciate that. One of the things I was curious about, it's not exclusive to cloud-based data, but um, with some of the higher level functions, the potential with like clinical decision support and developing evidence-based medicine further, like I was wondering what the legal framework is right now in terms of like, does it present obstacles versus opportunities with liability? Yeah, so, you, you know, um, I was just sharing with David one of the comments that, uh, I was actually at the very, one of the first uh, meetings for the Sentinel Initiative that when they were trying to organize it and both myself and one of my counterparts at Mayo at the time and I haven't been involved with it since but we both walked away because they weren't willing to give us indemnification if we supply data that showed that we were doing the wrong thing and I think most providers when you start talking to them that we're going to start looking at your behavior when it comes to order sets or best practice alerts or even prescribing medications when a red, red warning comes up saying that you shouldn't be prescribing this will we'll be a little bit like, well, you know, you can't read my mind about why I decided not to do something, so how are you going to really make sense of it? I think that the real answer there is that if you de-identify it and you give the clinicians enough comfort that you're going to be aggregating it um, and you're drawing not specific individual uh, decisions from it but generic decisions, um, I think it can be done. We, I did a publication in CHEST where we looked at alerts for alpha-1 antitrypsin screening and it showed it was a completely negative study. Clinicians basically completely blew away the, blew off the alert, telling them that this patient should be screened. Um, and when you went back to them, they knew that it didn't matter. It, it, they knew better than the computer did about what should be done. At least every clinician feels that way. And some days I feel that way too. But I think for certain things, if you aggregate enough, you can give a generic sense of what's happening with that. I think it's probably fair game and you're not gonna get a lot of pushback. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not gonna give you a legal framework for that. But I will tell you that from a de-identified data set point of view, there's a lot we can do that I don't think the clinician has a lot to say about, say about what happens. At least not legally. They may have a say professionally. Um, first, I have two questions. First, I want to follow up with his question, which is how the heck do you get this heterogeneous gibberish of all these different 120 hospitals and docs and so on together? And I've heard Steve McHale describe it's a hate group or some, yeah. something like Google. Yeah. The different software that breaks through, could you explain that a little bit? And secondly, um, so what question? In other words, if I'm a doc at one of your 120 uh, hospitals, how do I use it or the hospital administrator? So let me, I'll answer the first question um, first. So this is a slide that went right over, but um, 
we have a, a database infrastructure that is called Hadoop and HBase. Hadoop and HBase is based on something called Big Data or Big Table that Google developed when they were inventing their search engine. Um, since then, it's been adopted by Yahoo, Facebook, and others. And the whole idea of it is very simple. In a traditional database, you need to understand what the information looks like first before you can store it. With Hadoop HBase, you don't need to know what that information looks like before you store it. You just throw it in there. I'm oversimplifying, but you throw it in there. And at the time you need to use it, then you have to understand what it looks like. And so it, it significantly accelerates our process of integrating health systems across the country because we can bring their data in and not worry about what it looks like until we're ready to use it. Um, in terms of your second question, uh, I'm sorry, remind me of what your second question was, sorry. Yeah, show me a practical use, okay, right. I've got your so, system, what right. do I do? So we have three distinct users. Okay. One is the researcher, like, like David, where you want to be able to, you know, he mentioned he has a million patients at Metro. Mm -hmm. But what if he wants to do an analysis on 24 million? He'd have to go out and call a whole bunch of people and say, can I work with you to do this? Or he can take our, our statistically de-identified data set, and we have an engine that runs on top of this, a, a interface, and do searches on all 24 million and come up with a signal that he can then use uh, to drive a grant or to drive another research project. That's the, the researcher who can plan accordingly. If he wanted to do the same I thing for... Huh? To, switch, to take the last question. Oh, and I, okay. I'll really quickly just say the providers do this from a healthcare uh, point of view, and then the administrators use this to understand what's happening with their health system. Yeah, I guess it's just more of a comment, but maybe it relates to that last question. Um, and it's just the nuance of population level de-identified data. Um, and I'll just bring this up from the legal perspective is that it's not necessarily considered human subjects research. So I think you know one of the issues you've been talking a lot about, you know, public health exception and IRB, and there we're talking about either individual level data or de-identified individual level data. But I think another whole concept that's very exciting to me, and Anil, I published one paper on this using Explorers, is the concept of population level de-identified data is not considered, it's not, it's not covered under HIPAA because it's all population level, and so it doesn't need IRB approval. Um, at least IRB, our IRB at Metro ruled it is not human subjects research, even though you know, at the ultimate start, it came from identified data in electronic health records. Yeah, just, I would agree completely, David. In fact, one of our largest customers, MedStar Health, uh, the MedStar Research Institute, essentially waived IRB requirements for using one of our products that just gives an aggregate population level summary. But as soon as you download that de-identified raw patient level, uh, it changes things in some uh, situations. So we, have, we support all different models, and I think it depends on the, the use case, and I think you've heard some of those use cases earlier. Thank you. So Professor of Law at Suffolk University Law School. Um, he has testified before Congress and state legislatures and served on government commissions and advisory boards, including the Food and Drug Administration and the Indiana Commission on Hospital Antitrust. Professor Rosbin, Rodwin has been the recipient of several prestigious fellowships and grants. He's been a visiting faculty member or a scholar at many universities in the United States and internationally, including France, Japan, Switzerland, and all sorts of exotic countries. He has published work in the New England Journal of Medicine, Health Affairs, and many other prestigious journals, and I've read a lot of it and cited a lot of it, and it's excellent. <coughs> he has degrees from Brown, Oxford University, a JD from the University of Virginia, and a PhD from Brandeis University, and he'll be talking about EMR data as public property. Good afternoon, good morning. Thanks for being here. So, uh, the focus of my remarks are going to be on the uses for secondary sources of data and the beneficial uses and property issues concerned to that. But I found when I speak about this issue that 
the privacy issue always comes up, and there's this related debate about privacy and ownership. So I need to say a few things about that, I think. Um, so the first thing is that there's a confusion about private <coughs> ownership of data and privacy, and they're not the same thing. And it's my contention that commercial interests out there that are using the fig leaf of privacy as a trump card really to advance their own interest in terms of commercialization of data and their self-interest. Uh, I think we can even make the case that private ownership of data can, under certain circumstances, reduce privacy, um, but certainly that it doesn't necessarily it increase privacy. And the main focus, is, as I said, is that uh, private ownership can reduce the beneficial public uses. So right now, if you look at the emerging markets, uh, there's a drive to create property rights in data. Um, and basically, the firms that own data, that use data, that were well not own data, that have access to data, insurers, hospitals, they have this data. They control it in some way. And they would like to be able to use it and to market it. Um, it's true <coughs> that apart from those groups, which I think is the driving force, there are privacy advocates that, for their own concern for privacy, also think that if you give individuals uh, property rights in their data or other groups exclusive rights to it, it will increase uh, privacy. But not everyone who's a privacy advocate that thinks that. Um, there's a debate. So there are really three issues. One is, in terms of the trade-offs between protection of confidentiality or privacy, on the one hand, and on the other hand, beneficial secondary uses, how do you balance that? But the second two issues you need to address uh, are whether a regime that considers this de-identified or anonymized data uh, is going to be better if it's a public control and use as opposed to a private use. And that applies both for the issues related to privacy and in terms of the um, um, beneficial uses. So again, my argument is for the privacy issue that the public ownership access does not prevent greater risk to privacy than uh, a private ownership. Let's turn now to the current status of law and control over um, data. Um, the law is pretty clear for physical property, for patient records. Um, the provider, the institution, owns the record. Uh, on the other hand, you have separate privacy laws that limit their disclosure of information in the record. So on the one hand, you have ownership and then privacy protection separate. Uh, the second element is that even if the record is privately owned by the provider, patients have a right to read and copy their medical records and consult it. And they can also get the record transfer. So you have private ownership, but you don't necessarily have the, uh, not all uses are determined by that private ownership. So again, records are private property, patients have access to them, uh, and there are, the ambiguous part is the data. Now, what changes with electronic medical records is you get rid of this idea that you have a physical uh, thing that's hard to divide where use by one reduces the use of the other where it, it can't because basically you could send this data to anybody, everybody, and it doesn't necessarily interfere <coughs> with it being used. So you have the, the setting for data being a collective uh, good. Uh, because it can be used by multiple party, uh, parties. The second thing is today, in terms of privacy protection, they really don't depend on ownership. Really, the privacy protections have to do with a layer of law uh, afterwards. And so in some senses, this issue of ownership of data is new um, an area. 
Now, the other issue that comes up with electronic data is the use of data in de-identified or anonymized form. When you have it in a record and you copy a record right away, you clearly got uh, identification. So in theory, and in theory only, you can have no confidentiality problem with uh, electronic data by just stripping it of, of uh, identifiers or anonymizing it, particularly for aggregate databases. But the theory is, and the idea, aim of anonymization is, is harder to put into practice than one seems. The privacy people, I'm sure, will get into it, but once you have a data set and you have any information that can identify someone like a zip code or a gender or their state of residence that might limit where they are and you combine it with other uh, databases that you can mesh the two together and sometimes identify the individual. So the, the great story I had is in a Massachusetts database where um, someone was able to get the data and identify Governor Weld's um, particular record because it had a zip code and then they were able to find out whether people were registered Democrats and Republicans and there were two or three other things and they got the age and by putting all those things together they were able to then get him record, they got the record and sent it to him and made a very dramatic point. Now of course there are two kind of reactions to that. One is to say since we can never be a hundred percent sure that anonymized data will be fully anonymous. We're just going to stop all use of the data because everyone knows there's no uh, perfection. Um, and the problem with that is it sounds nice and practical, but in fact, it's not really a solution in terms of the current world because we have this data already, if not everything that we could have that I would like to have public, a large chunk of data out there from billing records and other records is already distributed, used by insurers, hospitals, and the like. They're already marketing it. So to say that we're not going to make it public and you'll get privacy protection misses the point that um, you can't just use the status quo. You're going to have to radically change the world, and it's not clear how you can stop all these other entities from uh, making any use of data. And certainly they are organized against anything like that. They um, uh, like it. So then the question is, can you have uh, encryption or other uh, uses and, and uh, there'll still be risks. Uh, now, just to highlight a few things in terms of this privacy issue, we currently have supposedly some protections under HIPAA, but in practice, the people out there, uh, this is where the, a big gap is in terms of the leaks because you can, employers, drug firms, insurance companies, marketing firms, all these groups there really um, have access to a lot of this data. And, and so the privacy risk is not, in my view, the future with electronic records, it's now and, and, um, and the like. The other thing I want to point out is a number of the groups that are advocates of making data not public or private. When you look at their, uh, what they say about privacy, it's very disconcerting. So the Markel Foundation, they did a huge uh, project on data and records and privacy. And they say in one of the reports that providers treat patient information as a highly proprietary asset that serves a means of, def of differential um, from competition. You have groups out there that are trying to use it and don't want to give it up. And the Heritage Foundation, which also argues this, says that um, governmental authorities should have to purchase this data. So it's going to limit um, public uses. And yet, um, at the same time, on the privacy issue, they push voluntary confidential stewardship standards and are against legal requirements or government intervention. Now, I hope you're skeptical enough to know that voluntary standards <coughs> or stewardship um, is not a very strong privacy protection. And there are problems with a governmental or a legal scheme, we all know, but at least 
in the law, in theory, there are remedies, there's enforcement mechanisms, um, there are possibility of damages. And when I participated in the Markel group things, the law firm had, firms had all their people there voluntarily sitting on these uh, commissions. And the one thing they said always is, we want to make sure there's no liability for any kind of disclosure of information accidentally, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's very clear they, they like this voluntary steward standards and say it will work. But then when you say, well, what happen if it doesn't? They're the first to say, absolutely, we can't, we, you, know, you can't have any kind of risk, liability, or damages, which suggests to me that uh, they're not that confident it will work. Um, now, the other problem for the selling, the basic idea that these one group of people think is, is if you give individuals ownership of their data, they can decide whether it's transferred to others and they can sell the data if they want uh, or check off on a form or fail to check off on a form and it will be used. Um, and supposedly you can get a market for data or privacy as they say, but I think the people who have looked at this, there's a couple of articles out there suggesting you're gonna have ma major market failures. It's very hard to specify what data would be used and by who, who, once you can sell it, it's hard to see what the second or third purchaser will do with it, let alone trace it and find remedies. There are enormous transaction costs in trying to implement or make this scheme. You'd need market regulation. And the idea that you could just give people rights and that would take care of itself um, is unrealistic. Um, and so you're going to need, if at the very least, incredible government regulation to make anything like that work. And I, I don't think it's realistic. So let, now let's talk about the beneficial private uses. And first let me say a little bit about the emergence market and data. Um, All the groups that, five minutes more? Okay, let me then move on from the private market and talk about the public uses. So my proposal is that we require hospitals and others to uh, report anonymized data to public authorities. This is already done for California hospitals. That this anonymized data would then be aggregated and used for public health um, and, and research purposes and basically <coughs> The typical arguments used for private ownership don't apply. This is not data that you need to give an incentive and ownership interest in to create. It's created, it will be used and made because doctors need to have these records. There's no kind of regime for intellectual property that you need to have to get people to uh, do it. Um, the other thing is if you have this privately, you can have firms such as the uh, one uh, fellow who spoke, Mr. Jane, and you can have uh, data sets from Medicare that are very large and that can create some beneficial uses for research and public health. But for public health purposes in particular, the gold star is a large base. The larger it is, the more aggregate, the more uh, valuable it is. And the problem with private ownership is that it's going to fracture the database. You're going to have lots of small competing databases. Um, some people won't sell their data. Some people, uh, will, the firms that have data, will want to market it on their own or think that, that, um, that it's more valuable to reduce risks of liability or oversight by not providing the data. Um, the, most of the firms out there that have this data and tap it combine the analysis of the data with the sale of the data. So if you want their data-derived services, you have to go to them. And if you have this in a public forum, you could have three or four firms that do the analysis, and you'll get rid of the kind of the monopoly, antitrust, anti-competitive aspect that's going to exist if you have a private market. Um, the other thing is, unless you have a public scheme to get reporting or the like, you're not necessarily going to get much of the data that's valuable uh, collected. The incentive will be to collect what's most valuable, where there's most market, and leave uncollected other data, and then it will be much harder for authorities to uh, get. Nor is it clear that you will get a long-term reliable source of data. 
uh, because firms will respond to market uh, pressures. So if we look, say, for example, at Medicare HMOs, we know that they drop out of the market for particular counties when they think it's not profitable rather than saying there's a need. And I think for data collectors too, there'll be ups and downs. Um, apart from the issue of whether you can even get a database, assuming you can get valuable databases in the private sector, you're going to have the other problem being the cost of purchasing it for public health uses uh, by public health authorities. And in case some of you have not noticed, their budgets being cut and people don't want to raise taxes. And the idea that people will just voluntarily shell out lots of money to buy data uh, is unrealistic. So let me conclude and then just see if you have questions um, that we can address if we have time. Um, You have another problem, which is what's called the anti-common problem. I'm not speaking in the microphone, excuse me. You've heard nothing I've said for the last 25 minutes. Uh, uh, there's a whole literature on this, and basically sometimes creating property rights can interfere with making something a valuable product. And in my article, I go into that. We don't have a lot of time. But actually, if you make this public, you can then facilitate the use and analysis of data by private firms. If it's private, um, you're, it's, I think, quite likely that you're going to have the reverse effect. So why don't we see if, are there time for some questions? Yes, so why don't we move to that. I mean, I, I loved your comment about <clears throat> sort of the, the, what I sense was sort of the ability to publicly report, but it, it just seems like there's a huge legal hurdles to that. I mean, I was in a meeting recently where, you know, right now under HIPAA, you can exchange data for patient care treatment and operations, and people said you should add a second P and an R to that to include public health and research. But it just seems like, you know, we're not there from a legal perspective. Well, absolutely. What I'm doing is suggesting that we need to change the law. But this is a law that can be changed and should be. We have an emerging problem and an emerging market. And um, what it, it's not conceptually hard to get legislation that requires a certain kind of reporting now or required if you don't like reporting then sharing and mandate access for public health authorities to get access and answer your queries that's another way to do it um, the question I'm addressing is just what do we need to do to get access to this data and it can't be done now absolutely um, okay. it's being done in parts by certain states that have mandating reporting. Massachusetts mandates certain data, California other, but this is a classic issue where we need um, federal legislation, I think. Uh, with respect to your comment about the concern about liability associated with, let's just take a doctor, uh, analyzing a doctor's d data uh, across the board of his patients with respect to a particular disease and whether he's successful in properly treating that, that disease. I mean, isn't, isn't that covered in most states in terms of being confidential and privileged as part of quality control, mortality, morbidity, uh, privileges of confidentiality? And why doesn't, or why can't that extend beyond that if it's all couched under, the, under that kind of scope or, or um, description of the use of the data? Well, there's certain kind of reporting requirements for communicable diseases and the like, and Medicare requires cost data. So there are different statutes that require certain data or protect data. Um, I, I think you were also worried about 
reporting confidential information. I'm talking about reporting information that's de-identified or has some protection in it. And so I guess I'm not uh, quite sure if you're saying wouldn't this violate confidentiality or why could be covered confidential because it's covered under this sort of quality right. control. Well, what I'm advocating for is a legislation that would require data at least for hospital records and for also um, uh, individual patient records that biller, um, uh, billing um, people get and access to it and to create it anonymized in a way. So I'm suggesting enlarging what's uh, available under current statutes. And not only what's available legally, but really was much harder to collect in the past when you didn't have electronic records. Now you can really amass a lot of this data in a way you couldn't years ago. Um, you were talking about the potential risk of combining two disparate data sets and accidentally or inadvertently re-identifying people, which is a risk. But the example of the William Weld case where somebody sort of deliberately mm -hmm. tried to re-identify and took medical records and then bought voter registration records, which weren't really publicly available, mm -hmm. to purchase them and put them back together. Although it was splashy and it made a point, um, what I'm interested to hear you talk about is, to what extent is that really a legitimate concern for the average consumer of healthcare? Because aside from somebody you know, doing that as a deliberate attack to show that there could be some vulnerability in the system, my sense is that the average researcher working in a lab or working at a computer isn't out to try to re-identify de-identified records, especially if they're operating under an IRB-approved protocol that says you can't re-identify these records. So how, how much of a concern is it really for you, and what, do you, what should we make of it? Uh, it I agree with you. Um, I don't think it's a major problem, but I found when I spoke and didn't talk about privacy, and just talk about the public benefits, everyone says, who is this fellow? He has no concern for privacy. He wants all my information up. And so I think it's appropriate to acknowledge that there's no perfection. And once you have data out there, there are risks. And the question is how you protect them. I think that the risks are as great, even if it's not privately owned, because all these insurers get it. Um, but I'm sure somewhere, somewhere along the line, something will not happen as anticipated um, a as it does now, as it has in the past. And so I wanted to kind of put that an issue and say, let's think privacy protections as a separate issue. Let's do a lot to protect it, but don't hijack the debate about public access to the data or public ownership of the data or public reporting of the data based on that point. So I come down with you. with you, yeah. Mark, I certainly think you've made a persuasive argument, but my concern is that the horse has already left the barn. Well, yes, but maybe we can get the horse back in the barn. Um, uh, you know, part of this debate has to do with ideas about the role of government, the public sector, the public interest. We have a long tradition of the U.S. having a pretty clearly defined position compared to a lot of the rest of the world of focusing more on private markets and on limited government role uh, and the like. And so you might say that it left the barn 100 or 200 years ago, not just 10 years ago when it was open. But we also have a tradition that talks about the public interest. We have public data sets, whether it be Medicare or Social Security. We have other property laws that look at um, collectivizing goods. We have traditions of having um, a public sphere. And so it's not an irreversible leaving of the barn. Um, there's nothing out there that puts in law or institution something that says the government can't have access to this or that it has to be owned. And so I think it's realistic to think in the future we could change it. Now, I agree with you at one point. There are a lot of interests out there that see themselves making money by having control of this data. 
and they will resist it. So, for example, one of our local hospitals was at it was a partner's hospital, I forget if it was Brigham and Women or Beth Israel, one of the Harvard hospitals, that got upset when Massachusetts created an all-payer database to make certain data available for quality because they were selling their own data. And so they didn't want to have their market cut out. Um, but that's so with a lot of issues out there, that there are private interests out there that are going to try to block some beneficial public use. And our job is to try to uh, resist that, I think. So I'll take the last question. Could you clarify what you think the legal barriers are to your proposal? Because HIPAA doesn't cover public health initiatives, and the research regs certainly don't cover de-identified information and have all sorts of exemptions. So what are the legal barriers to your proposal right now? Well, I think the legal barriers to our proposal are not publicly funding elections in Congress, lobbying laws, and those kind of things, the diffusion of power, the balance of power. Our constitutional system is set up very well to block things. So it's very easy to resist change. You have to have two houses of Congress. But there's nothing, as I see it out there, in terms of a constitution or a statute or you know, a proper government where people say, oh, okay, you can never do this because you have to fundamentally change our legal structure. The, pri the property law out there doesn't do it, doesn't say that. So, so I think it's more of a political legal barrier, which are considerable. And I think that's what you meant, Max. You, you want to have a reply? OK. Well, I, I, I certainly wasn't suggesting that it will come through the next session of Congress uh, early, in, uh, early in the term. Yes? All right. Uh, why can't I get a royalty if somebody makes money off my health record? I'm, I'm all for private industry, but yeah. I want to get a piece too. Right, but you're not getting it now when they sell it, and um, and uh, and and there's nothing that suggests that they anyone has to give you a royalty, so they're unlikely to do it. So if you want a royalty, you have to change something to get it, and maybe you think you're entitled to it, but the law doesn't support it now, and you're not getting it now, and I don't think in practice, you will get a royalty even if you change the law or it won't be v worth very much because people that buy this anonymized data need to buy millions of records, billions of records, and they're not going to haggle an awful lot to give people, they're either going to check you consent or, or, uh, or they won't buy it or they'll give you some minimal. But if, if they had to give even a dollar for each record. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is you do get a benefit if it's not a royalty in cash because the knowledge from this helps keep the system fraud down. It helps develop safety. And so I think there's a strong argument that your greater public benefit by sharing this that reverts to people rather than to individuals. Your data and mine is valueless individually. No one wants it. What they want is a huge database. That's valuable. And so their network its effects. So in a private market, it's only going to work if they create some way to get, if not all people, a huge database. Um, and I think as a user of the health system and the benefits and science and research that helps your health now, I think you're getting a return on other people using other people's data in the past, learning from it. And since you're not sacrificing something from giving your data in terms of losing a benefit or some other commercial opportunity. I think the moral arguments for saying that we should compensate you uh, to share in this system is, is uh, weak. All right, we will break for lunch now. Lunch is in room A62 across the hall and we'll reconvene at 1245.